Dr. Lachman, welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. Many thanks for inviting me. It's really my pleasure to talk about the stock market to the audience. Well, and we'd love for you to just make a few opening comments, if you might, and then we're going to go to some questions. Yeah, I thought that I might just make some very broad statements about the stock market. I'm very pleased that you've got this on your program, because this is a very important part of a market-based economy like the United States. It's part of the success of the United States economy. And this is really distinguishes us from a centrally planned economy like the Soviet Union was many years ago and like China was some 30, 40 years ago, those economies don't have stock markets. So I thought I'd explain a little bit about what a stock market is, and we can then, I really look forward to the questions. So basically what a stock market is, is it's a place where people trade shares. And what shares are, are piece of paper that indicate that you've got a stake in a particular company. So maybe this is best explained if one looks a little bit about the history of stock exchanges, how did they come about? What made this all work? Well, it all goes back to, if you go back to Holland around about 1600, that there were these enterprises that were gonna send boats to India to bring spices to Europe. And that involved getting a lot of money. So nobody really had that amount of money, you know, to buy the boat, to get all of the crew on the boat, to then buy the spices, to take this six month voyage around the Cape to do that. So what they came up with the idea is why don't we constitute a company and let this company have shares. So what they did is in order to raise, to raise a big amount of money, they asked a whole bunch of individuals, if you give us a little bit of money, you can have a small stake in the company. And then once that got off the ground and once you had that, they began trading these shares in the company. They began trading it in coffee houses and then it eventually formed to having an organized stock market. And that's basically what we've had in the United States since around about 1790, the New York Stock Exchange, there was the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, the many other stock exchanges. And that is where people, companies can raise a lot of money and individuals have got a stake in the companies. So what are the advantages of this? You know, One of the advantages that I've mentioned is that people can raise a lot of money. So if we look at a uh, modern day personality, somebody like Elon Musk, however rich he is, he wouldn't be able to get the kind of capital that he needs, the kind of money that he needs to build this company that's gonna produce electric cars, that's gonna really revolutionize uh, the world. Uh, so what he does is he goes and forms this company, sells shares, those shares accumulate, and then different people have got stakes in it. So he can raise a lot of money to do something that is really going to change, going to be very productive for the US economy, and all of us benefit from that. The other advantage is that it allows individuals to have a stake in companies so that they, when they have their savings, they can put their money into a company. And how they benefit from that is they get paid periodically. If the company is profitable, they get dividends. And then there's also the possibility that if the company is successful, the share prices will rise. So they can at any stage sell their shares, get money from that. So that is the upside, of course, the downside is that if the boat sinks and all the capital gets lost, well, you can lose all of your money in that uh, venture. So I've said the first advantage is that companies can raise a lot of money and be efficient. The second is that individuals, widespread people 
can get a share of this and can participate in profitable activity. And the third advantage of a stock market is that it allows signals to be given to the economy so that successful companies, their share prices will rise and they'll be able to raise additional money. Whereas the ones who fail, their share prices will fall and they won't be able to raise the money. So this is a way that the market system works, that we allocate capital by having people judge whether or not it's successful. The market figures out whether or not a company is successful and those companies is where we get money going. So it's different from a centrally planned economy where the government would decide that and the government tends not to admit mistakes. So they throw more and more and more money at something that is totally useless. So that is really the big advantage of uh, having a, a stock market. So let me just mention a couple of other things before, uh, a couple of terms you know, that might be useful uh, before we uh, get into um, a discussion. You know, perhaps we'll move to what's going on right now with the stock market. It's a very uh, topical uh, subject. You know, that first there's the term of bulls and bears. Bulls means you're very optimistic about the future. You think things are going to be bright, going to go up, you're going to buy. Bears, on the other hand, think that things are not going to do so well, that they're going to go down, and therefore those people sell. So, you know, when we're talking about a bull market, you know, which is what we've had for certainly the last year and a half, you know, since uh, the terrible bear market with Corona, you know, when Corona struck, share prices plummeted 30 odd percent. Uh, that was a terrible bear market. Now we've been for the last 18 months in a bull market where share prices have more or less uh, fully recovered and more that, you know, you've had the strongest bull market that we've had uh, on record the last 18 Month. So I thought that that might be uh, something useful to know. The other thing I'd mention is that markets need to be regulated. So during the 1920s, there were a lot of abuses uh, that there was insider trading or that shareholders were sold a bill of goods, that the information wasn't good. So we've got a Security and Exchange Commission now that ensures that companies report properly, that directors can't buy their shares or front run the market. So you've got some sort of uh, protection uh, for uh, stock market, uh, for the individual. So it's important that the individual is not misled by uh, companies, by false information. Uh, so that is a important role uh, that the SEC tries to play. Uh, the last thing uh, that I would say is, um, you know, stock markets can become very speculative and not do the proper function. You know, they can become, John Maynard Keynes famously referred to the stock market of the 1920s as a casino, where people were just guessing what other people were doing. They were not doing the correct evaluation. Uh, uh, but Warren Buffett, uh, a legendary investor in the United States, what he says is that stock markets in the short run, they're voting machines. It means just people can speculate, it can go up and down. But in the long run, they're weighing machines, you know, so they really reflect the true underlying value of the companies involved. So I thought that would just perhaps set up the conversation and uh, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. All right, well, I get to go first. I'm so excited. Um, Mr. Lottman, that was fascinating. Okay, so um, I'm always the one, it, it, all of us ask different types of questions. And so my role is I'm always kind of uh, getting down to the nuts and nuts and bolts and the basics for our younger viewers and things of that nature. When, so I'm gonna give you some lightning round questions. When did our stock market open? Oh, the stock market opened many years ago. It opened around about 1790. So it really goes back right to the start. 
But the stock market in 1790 obviously was nothing like it is today. You know, that the New York Stock Exchange today is the largest stock exchange uh, in the world. You know, so you've got really the most companies uh, trading, but that really reflects the strength of the United States economy. But, you know, this isn't a new, I the stock exchange in the United States is not a new idea, you know, that the founders uh, knew about that. And pretty much uh, once the United States had independence, they had their own stock exchange. Okay, so at first, you know, the president, Washington started in 1789. So this was right out of the bat in 1790. Um, were there any founding fathers that actually were championing this in particular? I'm not sure of precisely which, but they certainly did have belief, you know, that this country was founded right from the start on the idea of the market economy, you know, that government should have a limited role. So uh, this is certainly uh, within the DNA, you know, of the country. Okay. And so did, it was the Dutch who did this first? Was this the East India Trading Company or is that different? Did you say yeah, the no, Dutch? No, that, it was the Dutch East India Company was the place where all of this started. So that the first stock markets go back to London, Holland, you know, that these are around about 1600, you know, so they've been uh, around a long time. You know, London uh, is really offered the competition to the United States for a long time. You know, it's really, the United States has really only challenged the United Kingdom in a big way after the Second World War. But, you know, until uh, then, the UK was really the uh, the world financial capital that could compete equally with the United States. Since you know, it, 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 uh, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, since the Second World War, you know that the United States has really eclipsed all the other countries. It's that it, it, it's noteworthy to contemplate upon the fact that you know we are like we are at war with Britain and you know we won, but really they they. They were the template for us in so many. Sorry, I have construction. If you can hear that, uh, they're the they were the template for us in so many ways. Um, we just uh, the stock market, obviously, being one of them. Um, okay, tell me the difference between uh, what and all of us, the the younger viewers that are listening, the Dow Jones and the Nasdaq. Talk talk about that. Okay, so the Dow Jones, you know, that is just a group of 30 companies, you know, that they've changed them periodically, but it's just 30 companies that uh, are within the index. Uh, what we've got is the, on the New York Stock Exchange, that is where the more traditional kind of companies raise money and that's where they traded. The NASDAQ is something a little bit more modern. That is where most of the high tech companies are traded. So you've got two different stock markets. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are several stock markets in the United States. Uh, you know, some are, there's an American exchange, the New York exchange, the NASDAQ, uh, but the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, those are really the main uh, markets. The idea is one really wants to follow how the market is doing. So that is the reason that you've got the Dow Jones index, you know, that you hear on the news the whole time. That is basically an average of these 30 companies, how they doing. Uh, it, it's telling us how that 30 companies are doing. What's a better guide as to the market is something called the Standard & Poor's 500. So that is not just 30 companies, that's 500 companies. So it gives us a better indication of how the market is doing. And then the NASDAQ is, uh, lets you know, you know, when they tell you what the NASDAQ is doing, that is telling you how do people feel about uh, the Googles, the Apples, the, uh, uh, Netflix, you know, all of those modern kind of companies, they generally are traded on uh, the NASDAQ. And uh, that is telling you where the more dynamic part of the economy is. 
Okay, you know, you hear that on the news, all you know, the Dow, the Dow Jones or the NASDAQ. And, and it really is the pulse, the sort of barometer you were touching on this earlier of where America's, whether America is optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, that it's, it's very uh, vulnerable, isn't it? I mean, if people think war is coming or uh, the, the kind, you know, if there's going to be a recession that's always reflected in the stock market. It's sort of the heartbeat, isn't it? It's sort of the- Ab abs Absolutely, that that is a barometer of how people think we're doing, you know, but they're really focusing not on the past, they're really focusing on the future. So it's very much like you say, uh, what we saw, you know, for instance, March of 2020 is when the coronavirus started, you know, people really freaked out, you know, they saw the economy being locked down. That meant that the companies weren't going to make profits. If they didn't make profits, they wouldn't have money to give as dividends. So what you saw is you saw the market really just tank. Uh, that that was really a very frightening uh, experience. You know, we've had other frightening experience in the past. You know, if there was a war in the Middle East and the price of oil went sky high, you'd find the stock market wouldn't do well. Or, you know, right now we focused on, you know, is there going to be a war in uh, between Russia and the Ukraine that can have implications for us? You know, that might be reflected in uh, the stock market. So all of those things tell you you know, when markets are getting fearful, they'll go down on that kind of news. But then there can also be very good news. You know, if we hear that the Federal Reserve is cutting interest rates or pumping up the economy with a lot of money, uh, you know, people then become more optimistic. You know, and that's really what we saw the last 18 months is that as the Federal Reserve kept printing more money, uh, people became very optimistic. The economy was recovering very strongly and people saw that, you know, they were too pessimistic about Corona. So we had the market uh, uh, becoming very buoyant, you know, the last 18 months. Um, okay, last question. Uh, it might, let me go back to, to what it was. Okay, last question, I'm gonna toss it to Tova. Government regulation. It, uh, you did talk about the SEC. I guess that was initiated by Congress to to start that. Other than that, is is uh, the the stock market is is really capitalism and free enterprise at its best? Is it not? Absolutely. But you know that free enterprise has to be have rules. You know, there's got to be some kind of regulation. Otherwise, what we get is we get a small group of people able to manipulate stuff and uh, really take advantage of the smaller investors. So the way in which this worked in the United States is that there were a lot of abuses in the 1920s. And when we had that terrible crash in 1929, you know, when people lost all of their savings, uh, you know, that is when the government uh, regulated uh, the stock market by creating at the SEC. You know, the trick is really to have some kind of regulation, but to be very careful uh, not to have over-regulation. You know, and I remember Hank Paulson, uh, who was uh, the Treasury Secretary uh, in uh, the Bush administration, uh, he once came into American Enterprise Institute and spoke to our trustees, and he said, anybody who thinks that you don't need regulation in markets hasn't worked in the markets. You know, and this was somebody from Goldman Sachs, uh, the president saying, look, we need some kind of regulation, but what they want is they want the light touch regulation, you know, just to make sure that let's make sure that this is a level playing field uh, that people don't uh, uh, mislead others with false information, you know, that companies can do that, they can withhold information or they can do insider trading, you know, that when they get the information ahead of everybody else, you know, that isn't really fair. So what they're trying to do is create a market where it's perceived to be fair so that people have got confidence in the stock market. They don't think that this whole mm -hmm. thing is just a Ponzi scheme where everybody's yeah. getting ripped off. You know, so we, want to, we, we want a stock market where 
people feel that they've got a stake in the U.S. economy, that mm -hmm. they've got their savings are going to be safe, that they've got a chance of making money for their retirement. You know, we're wanting that to, uh, to. to occur. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, I just want to make sure make sure everybody has time. I'm going to toss. Everybody gets their 10 minutes. I don't want to. <laughs> okay, Tova, go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, this has been really, really interesting. I'm learning so much. Um, I was wondering, uh, how does a company decide whether or not to go public or, you know, list themselves on the stock market? How do they make that decision? Um, and are, are there any metrics they use? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, companies needn't go uh, public, uh, you know, that they can decide that they want to just stay, you know, that if you've got a partnership, you've got enough money. Uh, you can stay private and you don't have to have all the headaches of having to report to shareholders and so on. But generally, once you reach a certain size, uh, what you might want to do is you might want to get money, take money out of the company by selling some of your shares to other people. You don't want to have all of your eggs in that one basket. What you might also want to do is you might want to expand you know, in a very big way. So, you know, what we see a lot on with the startup companies is they start up as a small idea, somebody in their garage or in their basement, they've got this idea. And then when it looks like it's viable and that they can go really big, they generally don't have the money to do that. So what they'll do is they'll go to some sort of either investment bank or some venture capital group and they'll go and seek outside capital so that's when they decide to go public you know it's when you're really wanting to be ambitious to do something really big you need money you can't raise all of the money from banks so you go to the public and you offer them some share in your enterprise and that's called that's the famous uh you know that's the famous you hear the term uh, IPO, you know, which is initial public offering, you know, that that generally is, you know, when these startups get to a certain size and they want to get very much bigger, that's when they decide that they want to uh, raise additional money. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then, as you mentioned, you know, the stock market used to be a physical place where people would go to like physically trade pieces of paper. Now with technology, it's very different. You can log on to any device and trade within seconds. So how has uh, the stock market been affected by new technology and, and being moved primarily online? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that really has occurred over time, uh, you know, so that there've been quite a number of developments that are favorable to the small investor, to the individual. So if you've got electronic trading rather than having to go through people, what that means is you don't have to pay the middleman a commission. You know, So in the old days, when you bought a share, you'd have to phone a stockbroker, a retail stockbroker. And what he would do you know, for the favor of doing this for you, he would charge you one or 2% on your trade. You know, so each time you bought and sold a share, he would be making, the broker would be making something. What the electronic trading has done is it's reduced those kind of costs to uh, the individual. So that's really been very good for the individual. So there's also been other developments, you know, of course, over the years, uh, there are many other developments. So one of them are all of these, what you call ETFs, you know, these are exchange traded funds. And generally what they are is they're a group of companies. So if I'm buying an individual company, I'm running a bigger risk. If that comes, if I think that's computers are going to do well or electric cars are going to do well, I might not want to buy an in individual company because that individual company could have problems. I'm wanting to buy a group of companies that are doing the same sort of thing. So that's what these ETFs allow you to do. You can buy an ETF that even covers the whole market. So it saves you once again, it saves the small investor. The small investor doesn't have to go to a mutual fund anymore where they'd have to pay fees. So it allows the individual uh, to do a lot better and it makes these markets a lot more efficient. Great, and then 
then, um, you know, for people who might want to start getting uh, involved in the stock market, maybe young people, um, what what sort of advice do you have for somebody who might want to put their money in the market, but, you know, doesn't know where to start? Yeah, you know, I think that young people, it's a good idea, you know, that to begin to learn about the stock market, to learn about the upside possibilities, but also to learn about the downside possibilities. So in my day, what a lot of kids did was they formed investment clubs, you know, because you can't, uh, uh, you don't have enough money to do much buying yourself, but, you know, with a group of people, you can buy uh, shares, you know, and you can begin studying this together and you can be doing research together, you know, and that's a very good uh, learning experience. This is something that, you know, I would really recommend, you know, aside from figuring out how this is good for the economy and makes us strong, uh, I think as individuals, you know, it's good to learn at an early stage. I'm worried right now, you know, I should say, uh, you know, what's occurred is a lot of young people have been sucked into the markets and, you know, thought that this has only got an upside, you know, and that many of them bought all of these fancy stocks, you know, they were called MEM stocks or, you know, high tech stocks and, you know, they promised the sky and these have come crashing down, you know, so it's good that while you're young, you know, you learn how this works, you know, so that you can make wiser investment decisions as you go along. But I'd recommend that, you know, you start reading, uh, you know, financial newspapers, you know, things like the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, you know, that really at a young age, uh, this is something, you know, I think that in this country, uh, there's not enough uh, financial uh, education. I definitely echo that. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, and then could you just briefly go over kind of the trends of the market recently or, or since the start of the pandemic? Since, as you mentioned, there have definitely been ups and downs. Um, so could you kind of give us an overview of that and kind of where, where we're at right now? Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, just a thumbnail sketch, you know, that of course there are always a lot of factors influencing the way the market works. So, you know, I mentioned Corona, I mentioned uh, a war with a uh, possible war with, between Ukraine and Russia or problems in the Middle East with oil. Or, you know, there's no end of uh, factors. But I would say that if you look at the last two years, there were two big issues. You know, that the first was with Corona, that when the United States economy shut down and when, you know, so we had the deepest recession that this country's had you know, in the post-war period, you know, that's the last 75 years or so, and it was a global event that affected companies. So you saw the market really crater. What happened then is something that we haven't seen before, and that is very relevant to where we might be headed right now, is the Federal Reserve, uh, that's the central bank, and I understand that you had a discussion about that, what they did is they came in and they bought a lot of bonds. They bought huge amount of bonds. You know, we've never seen anything like this. They bought five trillion dollars of bonds. They kept interest rates very low. So if people didn't have an alternative uh, where to put their money, you know, if they put their money in the bank, that gets zero interest rate, or if they bought bonds, that get practically zero interest rate. So people began to buy stocks, and that created a upward. Trend. Now that has gone on too long. And where we are right now, you know, to answer your question, is that right now the Fed is beginning to slam on the brakes, you know, because what their policies have done is they've created a lot of inflation. And so what the Fed is now doing is they saying, look, we can no longer, what Chairman Powell said at his last press conference is we can no longer. Uh, buy bonds. So we're going to stop buying bonds in March. And in March, we're going to start raising interest rates. So that when they begin raising interest rates, that's likely not to do be very good for the stock market. Just one point I can mention, you know, if you're wanting to measure how the stock market is valued, you know, is it at 
fair value or is it very rich or is it uh, undervalued? What people do is they look at something called the price earnings ratio. So that is the price of all of the shares divided by their earnings. That gives you a good measure of where the stock market is. I would just say that in December, that ratio got to twice its uh, level over the past 100 years, past, twice the average of the past 100 years. And it, it was at a level so high that we've only seen that once in 100 years before. The only time that we saw that was in uh, something like uh, 19... Uh, 1990, you know, when the dot-com bubble burst, you know, so that is telling you many people are afraid that what we're in right now is a stock market bubble, and that when the Fed begins raising interest rates, we're going to get the stock market going down a lot. But, you know, it's uh, difficult to predict where the stock market is going to go, but, you know, that's where it's looking like right now. Great, thank you. I will pass on to the next person. I appreciate your answers. Hello, Dr. Lachman. Uh, so in the stock market, when is the NYSE a private corporation itself? I'm not sure. Uh, with whether it's it's probably is a private uh, organization itself, or you know it's probably a group of uh, the investment banks having a stake in having the market. So I, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. The uh, so when when we prepared for the show, we looked at some of the some of what you talked about about how how it started, and it is so interesting our stock market in general, um, how it allows an individual just a person to kind of own a piece of a business. So when you buy a stock, there's an the initial market offering and you buy, you buy a stock and you're a shareholder in a company. When that company decides to um, make more shares, what happens to your stock that you already own? Yeah, you, you know, it's possible that uh, you can get uh, diluted, you know, that that would be the case. But generally, what would be occurring is they'd be issuing the stock, you know, when the company is doing rather well. What you've got as well, you know, as a shareholder, you know, and that this is uh, an important point, is that as a shareholder, you've got a vote at the annual meetings. You've got a vote in terms of the board of directors. You know, you've got the possibility of getting rid of the board of directors if the company is not performing well. You know, so you do have uh, the ability, you know, that the shares generally come with a vote. So the company can't just go off and do what it likes, you know, so generally they're going to be doing what is in the shareholder's interest. Now, when they are perceived not to be doing that, you know, what you'll have is you'll get somebody uh, who will raise capital, you know, that there'll be these figures on Wall Street uh, these big funds who will take over the company, you know, fire all of the directors, you know, reorganize the company. So, you know, we've got that way is the way in which the system, you know, keeps generally keeps people um, on Honest. their toes. <laughs> yeah. So, but so technically though, buying shares is not exactly buying a percentage, that percentage of a company. So you no, don't, it, it because they could dilute your percentage by a, a new market offering. They could go to the market, correct. They could go and raise uh, additional capital, in which case uh, you would get uh, diluted. But, you know, like I say, is that it's not likely to be occurring against the interest of everybody you know the, what they'll be yes. doing is they might be raising you know they might be issuing additional shares so that they can raise additional capital and uh expand the operation you know they presumably do it you know when they see that there's an opportunity what happens as well uh you know is that periodically you know the reverse happens you know that that's what's occurred is that if the companies 
see that there's not much in the way of opportunity. You know, for instance, like when the companies got a tax break with uh, the president Trump, you know, when he had the big corporate tax break, they had didn't know what to do with the money. So what they did with the money is they bought back the company's shares. So in other words, they were buying back shares. So you as an individual shareholder benefited because what they did is by buying back the shares is they bid the price of the shares up, you know, so you yes. could really gain. Yeah. So then um, just my last question, when right now as the market continues, well, it's hit, like you said, it's hit historic highs, uh, bullish highs. Could you, could that be tied to inflation since holding paper is more, uh, would be a greater risk to someone who would be worried about inflation, you'd be safer buying the stock market than not that it'd be the safest thing, but it'd certainly be safer for someone thinking about inflation that if, that if we just flooded the market with the uh, coronavirus relief, that there's so much more money in digital circulation that it's safer to be in the stock market. Yeah, you know, your question is great, but it's a little bit complicated. So let me put the two cases and I'll tell you which one I think dominates. So you're right that in an inflationary environment, you're wanting to own assets because they're going to go up with the prices. So for instance, like uh, companies, their profits should improve because the prices are all going up. So that's the positive side. The negative side, which I think you know, totally dominates the positive side, is that with inflation being high, the Federal Reserve has to take the punch bowl away from the party. It's got to begin raising interest rates. So when they raise the interest rates, then bonds become more attractive than stocks, you know, that they relatively become. So people then move the money out. The other thing with inflation, you know, which is very problematic for the stock market is, you know, sure, the inflation itself will push up profits. But when the Fed is forced to slam on the brakes and raises the interest rates, the economy slows. When the economy slows, the profits slow as well. So that is really what the markets are looking at right now, is they're looking at inflation in exactly the opposite way that you're thinking about it. They're looking at inflation is they saying, what has kept the market going throughout 2021 was the fact that the Fed was printing so much money. They were buying $120 billion of bonds each month, and that was pushing up the price. Now that the inflation is here, I mean, what the Fed was doing is was pushing up the price of the shares, but they were also pushing up inflation. Now that they've got inflation at 7% and their target is 2%, the Fed has to jack interest rates up and slow down the economy. So that's, so that's really where the market is afraid. You know, that, that's why my thinking is that this might be the trigger that bursts the stock market bubble, you know, brings it down. The reason that we're at these ridiculously high price earnings ratio that valuations are so high is because interest rates are zero. That if interest rates now, if the Fed has to raise interest rates, you know, some people on Wall Street are saying that over the next two years, the Fed's going to have to raise interest rates at least 10 times. You know, if that occurs, then, you know, the stock market party might be over. Yeah, it's scary. Very interesting, though. And uh, I think you raise a, a a very scary issue for people, depending on how they're invested, because, uh, you know, we haven't really seen this kind of this kind of uh, action from the Fed at this scale recently. Um, I really? guess 2008 to 10 would be around that era. Did we freeze, Kathy? No, you're still there. All, All right. right. OK. Our screen froze, but good. We didn't freeze. Um, I was just uh, just thinking about the markets. I was curious, just real quick, does the stock market usually closely relate itself to the housing market? Because I know both have been in incredible highs. So now the housing market is coming down. Uh, it started a few months, a couple months ago. But I'm just curious, are they usually closely related? Uh, 
they wouldn't be as closely related as this time around. So this time around, what is going on is the same factors are driving the two markets. You know, so that's why we've got a housing bubble as well as a stock market bubble, because the Fed was buying all of these bonds. They were buying mortgage-backed securities as well. Interest rates, you know, what drives housing prices is largely interest rates, you know, because if the mortgage rate is 5%, you can afford a house for $250,000. If the mortgage rate is 10%, you can afford only half the house, you know, so interest rates really drive this is this conjunction, you know, what we've seen the last year and a half is something that we haven't seen before. We've never seen the Fed as aggressive in pumping up the economy as it's been the last uh, at the last uh, year and a half. You know, that it, it made very little sense because, you know, what the Fed was doing is they were having their pedal to the metal, really going full steam ahead. And the government was going full steam ahead with big budget increases. So, you know, it's not a surprise that we've got the inflation and that we had this incredible boom in the stock market. The question is now, you know, do we get the hangover? Okay. And now I'm wondering, so I'm a company, okay? I want to go public. If I enter the stock market and say one, I know it's not very likely, but one person or one group buys uh, 51% of my stocks. Well, then they own my company. So what are the, uh, what are the guards or protections against that? And how does a company, how much percent and, or is it a hundred percent that a company will go in to with their shares in the stock market? Okay. Well, typically what will happen, you know, th this is a question that you as the, companies say that you've got a startup company, you can decide how much you want to let go. You know, so if you're worried about losing control, you're not going to give more than 51% of the shares. So, you know, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be telling people, uh, I'm just wanting to raise $10 million, you know, and I'm only prepared to give up 20% of my company. So, you know, if you say I'm giving up 20% of my company for $10 million, you know, what you're doing is you're putting a valuation on your company of $50 million, but you're holding the other shares. You're only giving people the chance to buy into some of your company. So that's typically what, uh, what the um, investors, uh, what the company founders will do is that they don't want to, the owner doesn't want to lose uh, control or, you know, he's wanting to be sure that he's got control of the company. So he's only inviting a relatively small part, but you know, that is for you to decide. You know, if you want to give up full control, uh, you know, you're, you're entitled to do it. You know, generally what you would do is you'd go to a, uh, you'd go to one of the investment banks and they would help you with this uh, IPO. You know, what they would do is basically for a fee, of course, they would underwrite it, you know, make sure that when you place it, that you're placing the shares at the right price, that the, uh, the uh, placement doesn't fail. You know, so what they're saying is that if other people don't take up the shares on offer, we'll take it up at the price that is uh, given. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. It's good to know. Uh, I think... We are up to our audience questions, but thank you very much for answering our questions. Thank you. That's very good. insightful. Well, thank you for the great questions. Well, and thank you, Dr. Lachman. We have got some great audience engagement and questions today. First of all, uh, Eric Braverman made a few comments on the Buttonwood Agreement. He says, uh, the Buttonwood Agreement is the founding document of what is now the New York Stock Exchange and is one of the most important financial documents in U.S. history. The agreement organized securities trading in New York City and was signed May 17, 1792, between 24 stockbrokers outside of 68 Wall Street. And according to the legend, the signing took place under a Buttonwood tree. 
And um, I just thought I would throw that out there for Eric, but do you have any comments on the on the Buddenwood agreement? Uh, no, I, you're asking me. Yes, if there's, I mean, if there's anything you'd want to add to that about the the Buttonwood agreement. No, I, I just find that uh, you know pretty interesting, and you know it's what I expected. You know that it would be something like the stockbrokers arranging it. You know that they're wanting to have an organized market. You know, as I mentioned at the start, you know that initially the way in which this worked is people would just do this informally at a coffee shop, but then, you know, you have to identify, you've got to find the trading partner. So it makes sense that 24 stockbrokers would come together and say, let's do this all in one place, you know, where we've got a real market. Everybody knows that if they're wanting to buy or sell a share, that is the place to go to, mm -hmm. you know, rather than to try and find somebody to parcel uh, the shares to. Definitely. And then Michelle Green asks, can you distinguish between the stock market and the speculative options markets? And then also the current derivatives bubble. Okay, uh, yeah, that's a great question. But you know, often what an option means is it's an option, you can have all sorts of options, but the stock market does provide you with the possibility of engaging in options. So what you do, what, what an option is that instead of actually buying Apple shares at the price of 100, you might say, I want to have the option to buy Apple shares in six months time uh, at, I'm prepared to, uh, if Apple, shares go up to 120, uh, I'm prepared to pay a dollar to have the right to tell you in six months time that I'm wanting to buy those shares. So if Apple shares go above the 120, you'll ex what they say is you'll exercise your option because if it goes to 125 and you paid $1 for the option, then you can make a quick $5, you know, so it gives you the chance of making a multiple of your money. So it's a more speculative part of the economy. So the two are, of course, uh, related and it satisfies, you know, different people have uh, different needs. It's a way that some people can take on more risk. Other people can reduce their risk. Uh, these are very well developed markets. So we've got derivative markets all over uh, the place, you know, what, what I was suggesting earlier is that the speculation is in the derivative markets, but it's also, you know, in the fundamental underlying market as well, you know, that that's where the valuations uh, get, uh, get very high. Well, thank you. And then uh, Frank Brown goes back to Jefferson and Madison and says, uh, Jefferson and Madison, tried to persuade Washington to veto the Bank of the United States Charter because they said the bank would confer to its majority shareholders exclusive advantages in manipulating the economy and the government. Do you think our experience with central banks has validated Jefferson and Madison's concerns? Yeah, that's uh, really a, a great question, you know, that that's taking us away from uh, the um, the question of the stock market, you know, that's more a broader and deeper question. And there is reason to be uh, pretty concerned, you know, that the performance of the central bank over the last 20 years or so hasn't been that encouraging. They, you know, their fingerprints were all over the housing market bubble in 2006 that led to the great uh, economic recession 2008 2009 and now i'm thinking that the current stock market and housing market bubble that is produced by the federal reserve it remains to be seen what the fallout is so you know there's something that isn't right you know whether you know one's wanting to go to gold or something of that sort you know that's a different matter you know whether you're wanting to reform have them uh play more by rules 
then have the kind of discretion that they've had. But this will be, a, 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 I've got no doubt uh, that this will be a very big political question, you know, in the years to come. You know, we'll see what how uh, this experiment, uh, like I say, is that you know, what the Fed did, it's difficult to exaggerate how aggressive they were, you know, that it took Ben Bernanke something like six years to increase the Fed's balance sheet by $4 trillion after 2008-2009. It took Jerome Powell's Fed less than a year to do the same thing. So they six times more aggressive than Bernanke was, and Bernanke was very aggressive, you know, so uh, we'll have to see, uh, you know, where this plays out. But I think that uh, the issue of what do we do with the central bank, you know, will really come back into play. Well, thank you. If we have time for one more question, uh, David Sawyer says mutual funds are prominent and popular and have been for a long time. Could you please explain their nature and significance as well as their pros and cons? Yeah, well, the pro of the mutual fund is that instead of an individual buying one stock, with say that he's only got $100 that would allow him to buy one stock, he can buy a mutual fund that'll have 50 or 100 stocks in it. So it means that his money is more diversified. He's not taking the risk, you know, that if this one particular company goes belly up, he loses all of his money if he just bought the one company. So what he rather does is buys a mutual fund that's got many, many companies. So the risk of it going belly up are very much less. Now, the trouble for the mutual funds, you know, the disadvantage is that the mutual funds do this generally charging you a fee, you know, so uh, you're giving up some of the gain, but, you know, you're getting the benefit that you're getting something more diversified. What the trouble is for the mutual funds right now is that they've been struggling because the development of these ETFs where you can buy the basket directly as if you're just buying an individual stock, but it's really spread out over a whole lot of other companies and you don't have to pay a, a fee to a broker to do it. But you know, for the individual investor, uh, you know, kind of mutual funds or ETFs uh, are a way to have less, a small amount of money spread out over a lot of shares that you wouldn't be able to do you know by yourself okay well great and um we do have one minute left and i think we've got a question from one of our students dylan riston asks and we've answered this a little bit uh in another answer but i thought we might want to give dylan a little bit more info he just says what do you do to invest in stocks i mean if you are a student and you want to invest in stocks what what would you do do you think well you know you can do that uh directly you know you could be buying a, a mutual fund but you know you, it's unlikely that you're going to have sufficient amount of money to do that so generally what's a good idea is to get into some kind of investment club and have a bunch of people pooling money together to buy a stock and then to do this as a learning experience. And talk to your parents and, and get their permission. <laughs> so. Okay, well, that's great. Yeah, that's um, what I was you, gonna say. Talk is there to your anything, parents. Yeah, is there anything that you wanna um, wrap up with? Did you ask me that question? Yes. Oh, no, I just think this has been great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lockman, so much for your expertise on this, our series on the economy and how can we do a series on the economy without talking about the stock market? And uh, gosh, I think you've answered everything we could possibly want to know today. So well, I, thank I, I, I would just finish by saying that uh, I've had a better bunch of questions from the group of students than I generally get, you know, when I'm on a panel at the American Enterprise from the adults. <laughs> There you go. We, we've got some amazingly brilliant students here, and but they're uh, uh, Jewel and Jordan have graduated college and Tova's getting ready to head to college, but 
and Aubrey, but they're all our contest winners and we're so proud of all of them. And they always ask the most stimulating, intellectually deep questions. <laughs> so thank you so much. And thanks to them. Would y'all like to say sign off, Jewel Jorantova, Aubrey? Yeah, thank you so much. This was really enjoyable and as always really educational. So have a great day and thank you for your time. Thanks, good to talk to you all. Thank you. And we invite our audience to join us next week. We're going to be talking about free enterprise, uh, financial capitalism, and we look forward to, to seeing everybody then.